Hey guys, welcome to another B-Belt by Rosa live from the Mecca. Uh, on today's show, what we're gonna do is we're going to show you some of my favorite, favorite contracted position movements. Last week we did favorite stretch movements. This week's gonna be favorite contracted position movements. Just as a reminder, holding the contraction or doing contracted position movements are really, really good for building muscle because that squeeze at the top uh, tends to fire off some extra muscle fibers. But if you exaggerate the squeeze, and hold it for a little longer, not only will you increase time under tension, but you actually enforce more muscle fibers to contract. So I'm gonna show you a few of my favorite movements to do uh, to get a really, really powerful contraction. As well, we're also gonna bring you some coverage from the Legion Sports Festival this weekend, and hope that you guys enjoy the show. So this is one of my favorite movements for the chest, especially if you're really getting that good contraction. It's a standing cable fly, but what we're doing is we're actually, as you can see, starting with the handles below the chest and bringing them up in an angle. So I'm actually contracting my pecs almost up as high as base level. So as I bring it up, I'm bringing it up in an arc after a slight stretch in the beginning, and I'm holding that contraction at the top of the rep for about three to four seconds, really trying to squeeze the pecs very, very hard and activate mostly the upper portion of the chest, because as you can see, I'm bringing it up by my face. An excellent movement if you're looking to build the upper inner portion of the chest. You can't isolate it, but you can target it. Excellent movement. Okay, when you're looking to build upper back muscles, this is an excellent movement to do so. It's a variation of a wide grip pull down that I invented a couple years ago. Everybody who does it really loves it. So what you're doing is you're putting yourself on an incline bench facing in at about 70 degrees or so. You're starting from a full stretch at the top and you're bringing the cable down sort of as an angle rather than straight up and down with a regular pull down. You want to bring it down towards the top part of the chest. You want to hold that contraction again for three to four seconds. Make sure that you're arching the lower back, sticking the chest up high to maximize the contraction and then use a controlled negative and go to a full stretch at the top. You don't want any half movements. Awesome movement for building the muscularity in the top of the back. Okay, so here we have a good Great movement for the lateral deltoids to build width. This is an incline low cable side lateral. As you can see, the bench is angled anywhere between 45 and 60 degrees is a good angle. I'm grabbing onto the handle. I'm starting with the handle a couple of inches away from my thigh. I never want to come down and touch my thigh. I'm keeping the arm almost completely straight, very slight bend in the elbow. The key to the movement is very, very strictly to do a lateral raise all the way up to about shoulder level a little bit higher anywhere where you feel that maximum contraction that's what we're after we're going to hold that contraction for about three to seconds do a very very controlled negative and again come down to that position just off the top of the thigh and this is a really really tremendous movement if you're having trouble building width into the lateral deltoid important for competitors and anybody else so here is an awesome variation of a single arm push down i call this a concentration push down because what you're doing is you're putting yourself in a position, your torso in a position that's very similar to concentration curls, where you're doing the opposite, you're extending the elbow rather than flexing the elbow. So I'm just grabbing onto the top of the cable, just holding by the ball at the end of the cable, using a hammer grip, and what we're doing is we're just squeezing down into the contracted position, very, very strictly. We're holding that contraction for three to four seconds as we always do, and we're doing a controlled negative back up across my body, getting a full stretch at the top, holding that stretch for about a second, and again, squeezing down into that contracted position. Don't try to use too much weight in this movement. This is a finesse movement. We're just really looking to exaggerate that contraction for three, four seconds. A very, very excellent way, especially to finish off a tricep workout with maximum pump. Okay, so this is an incline barbell curl. Uh, I actually like this movement a little bit better than the preacher because the arms are hanging free. Uh, so you're forced to really make sure that you're only using the biceps, especially if you do it the way I'm doing it here, making sure that the elbows are kept in close to the body. I'm not letting my elbows come forward as I curl it. I'm starting from a full stretch. I'm coming up very, very strictly to the top of the rep. And as you can see, I'm holding that contraction. Again, hold that contraction for three to four seconds and really, really squeeze, hyper-contract those biceps. This is an excellent movement for building peak on the bicep because we're actually activating the brachialis very strongly. When you build the brachialis, it's gonna push up on the biceps. It 
give you that illusion of greater peak and greater height on the biceps. Gives us a shot in your next bicep workout. I'm telling you, it gives you a really, really great burn. Awesome way to finish the workout with also an awesome pump. Choosing a coach. This is something that I actually asked Chris to, to let me throw in here. And even though it says choosing a coach, which obviously I didn't do that spelling. We'll have to blame Chris for that. Um, so don't choose a coach, choose a coach. A lot of people in this industry, it's becoming very, very popular to have a coach when preparing for shows. If you do decide to choose a coach, do not go on Instagram and find somebody who has the most followers or has done one show and now calls himself a coach or has a great set of abs and says they're a coach. Uh, coaching is something that takes a long time to master. I know that I've been in this industry myself 30 years and coaching people about 25 years. So make sure that you look for somebody who has experience, uh, somebody that has education, whether it be certifications or college degree in the area, somebody who has a lot of passion. Find somebody that who wants you to win as much as you want, that they're very, very passionate about the results of their clients and they're not just there to make a buck. And the last thing I'm gonna say real quick because we gotta move this along is that try to choose a coach that does not have so many clients. Uh, if you have 100, 200, 300, 500 clients, you're not gonna be able to pay personal attention to each person, it's, it's impossible. Unless you can clone yourself and so far we haven't done that. But um, I know that I keep my clients uh, even when I hit about 40 or so, I try not to go past that because I always feel that I'm not able to give the personal attention that I want to give to each client, and that's what's most important to me. Uh, I don't do anything cookie cutter, so if you, somebody has a team of 500 athletes, you can bet that a lot of what you're getting is cookie cutter stuff and not personalized to you. So choosing a coach is just as important as choosing a doctor, therapist, you know, any important thing in your life. So just be very, very careful when choosing a coach. I, I know that you're looking, I think you said something about wanting some tips. Um, so I'm gonna go in a little bit of a different direction than everybody else because as a coach, one of the things I've been doing over the last 30 years, I've been developing very, very unique training programs because I believe that most people out there who are training are not getting nearly out of every session that they can be. And one of the things that I try to impart on all of my clients who go all the way from novice up to Olympians is when you're training in the gym, it's not enough to just go and do sets of 10 reps or whatever and go to failure and just think that you're done. I try to express to people that the mind-muscle connection, which a lot of people think is some type of hooey, is actually so absolutely true that actually there's been studies done where they've actually hooked up electrodes to muscles of like runners and had them uh, literally just think about running a race and the muscles and the quadriceps and the hamstrings will start to contract which just goes to show how connected the, the mind and the body is. So when you're in the gym and you're training, you gotta go, listen, having good form is a great thing, you shouldn't cheat, whatever, the technique is great, but you have to think about every rep, absolutely from beginning to end, every centimeter that you're moving or weight you should be thinking about. You should be thinking about the stretch on the muscle. You should be thinking about the contraction. You should be thinking about the negative contraction, the lowering phase, the eccentric contraction, um, excuse me, the eccentric contraction, the lowering phase, the concentric contraction, the, the positive phase. Get so in touch with the muscle that you're actually becoming one with it. I know that kind of sounds zen, but you can really, really do this. And if you do this, you'll actually find that you're gonna get much more sore, you get, the workout's getting much more productive, you're gonna feel everything much more. And one of the things that I say to people is stop thinking about doing a set of 10 reps. I say do one rep 10 times. So in other words, every rep is a set. 
That's how you have to think about training. And if you can think about training this way, I promise you that you can make weak points into strengths. You can take what look like genetic defects that you think, oh, it's my genetics, that's why I don't have a wide back, and you can build a wide back. You can take things far beyond that you've ever taken things before if you have this mindset in the gym. And it's very, very difficult because when I teach people to do sets of 10, most people, they go one second up, one second down, the set takes about 20 seconds. Each rep when I'm training a client could be taking five seconds on the way down, one or two seconds at the stretch point, two seconds on the way up, two seconds at the squeeze. Every, every rep could be taking 10 seconds. So you have to stay in that mindset, sometimes for a whole two minutes. But the difference is absolutely able to be seen. And I know this because I've taken some people who are you know, masters competitors who figure they've reached their genetic potential because they've been training for 30 years. Uh, or that they, like I said, have genetic defects, oh, I'm never gonna have this or have that. And I have rebuilt their physiques and literally changed them so they look like a completely different person. And I think that a lot of people focus in this sport too much on the pharmaceutical end and what can I take to get bigger or, you know, what, what you know, I don't want to, whatever drugs, whatever. They don't realize the importance of training. It all comes down to training. You can even eat great if you have a great diet, but you don't train, obviously you're not gonna grow. You can train right and have a decent diet and still grow. Now if you can put all of it together, then obviously you've optimized the situation. So the next time you go into the gym, shut everybody out. Maybe just focus on your training partner if you have one. But close your eyes, get into that muscle, and think about every centimeter of every single rep, and think about one rep at a time, not the final set. Do one rep 10 times, not a set of 10, and I promise you that you're gonna see the difference in your training. Is that for anybody in particular? If you want to just take the mic and start? There you go. <laughs> well, looks like I'm, I'm the one who's gonna take this one. So, um, I think, you know, as an athlete, you know, we, we really are um, very, very careful keeping track of our nutrition, but I think that it becomes on a completely uh, new level when actually preparing for a show versus the off season. Um, or maybe it has a chance to be a little bit more relaxed with your diet. But really, when, when you're a competitor, there's really no time in the year uh, that you're not generally not weighing your food, you don't pretty much always know around where your calories are, where your proteins, your fats, your carbs. Um, because you have to, during the off season when you're not competing, is when you're actually making the progress. So I don't even like calling it off season, I like call it the progress season. Uh, because that's when you're gonna make improvements for the next year. So really you're, you're, you're keeping pretty careful track of your diet throughout the year. Some of these guys and a lot of competitors have coaches who will actually do that for them. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're a very coachable athlete and you trust your coach, you're pretty much just going to follow the lead that they give you. If you're on your own, you know, you, you have to be a little bit, you know, you could use a formula like we discussed before, the uh, Aragon equation or something like that. But it's really carefully tracked. When you're an athlete, you have to track throughout the year. There's really no time to relax in terms of tracking. And of course, like I said, during progress season, sometimes there's a few more cheat meals or this and that. But uh, it's something to... Uh, make sure you can sit a year round. As far as hormones go, some people are better about that than, than others. Uh, Danny was doing was was talking before about hormones and how important it is, and I, I fully agree, uh, to keep track of your hormones: uh, testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, growth hormone, IGF-1, thyroid, uh, liver enzymes. Uh, periodically throughout the year, uh, what would you say? How many how many uh, how many times would you? Test it. How many weeks in between tests? Like you do like every four weeks, every eight weeks, every quarter. So at least at least three or four times a year, uh, because you want to make sure that obviously uh, all your hormones are optimized uh, towards muscle growth, towards body fat loss, uh, you know, and that you're of course healthy. And that's the most important thing. Uh, a lot of things in this sport that we do, uh, even just the way that we train, the stress that we put on our bodies. Uh, can have a very negative effect on our hormone levels. Uh, and then of course when you add in certain chemicals that are used, which is just
just part of competition, uh, you know, you have to make sure that your body's healthy because if it's not, then it's not going to react well to anything that you do. Uh, and of course, you can end up sick if that's not something you want. So, as a competitor, you should definitely like keep everything, keep track of everything year round, whether you're in competition season or not. Uh, you should know pretty much what your calories are. Like I said, proteins, fats, carbohydrates. Uh, or have your coach do that for you uh, and definitely get the blood work checked uh, at least every quarter or so to make sure that uh, you're healthy and functioning, uh, your functions opt optimized for your training and, and everything else. Is, is it typical for someone to track their micronutrients as well, like their vitamin A, D, D, K, those things? I don't, I don't think a lot of people do that, um, to be honest. Uh, but I think that's, you know, some people who, there are a lot of people who will, you know, go that far, but I think that they are more rare. Uh, but I think that it could be a really good idea to have those things uh, checked to make sure that, you know, the, because sometimes competitors' diets are very limited, uh, you know, they may only use one protein source or two protein sources. They may not eat a lot of vegetables. So there's certain, you know, micronutrients they could be missing. Uh, and of course, this can negatively affect your health. It can negatively affect your performance and your physique. So I said some people do go to that level. Obviously, I can't speak for everybody, but I think that's more of a rarity. Uh, but I think that's something that's very, very important, and, and more competitors should actually do that.